So, uh, good morning, everyone in India. My name is Greg Kushner. I'm the founder and CEO of Emrod. Um, Emrod is the first company in the world, as, as you've heard, to offer commercial long range wireless power transmission solutions. And I've been asked to tell you a little bit about what we do and how we do it. So, the term wireless power has been used uh, in relation to a variety of technologies, really. Um, so I'm going to start the talk today by defining what is long-range power, uh, power transmission, or telenergy as it's sometimes referred to, to make sure that we're talking about the same thing. I will then briefly describe how it all started and the gradual progress over the last century that, uh, that brought us today. Um, MROD is certainly standing on the shoulders of giants, and I believe it is important to acknowledge the research that got us here. I will then talk about what does it take to turn long range power transmission into a commercially viable proposition, and also show you some of the commercial applications that we have been addressing at MROD. I will conclude by explaining MROD's technology and how it is used. So first things first, uh, everybody uh, likes to mention uh, Nikola Tesla. Um, over 100 years ago, 130 years ago, in fact, Nikola Tesla was the first to realize the huge potential in uh, wireless power. Um, I find it quite incredible because uh, at the time, uh, electricity, uh, certainly electricity grids were just at their infancy. Certainly a genius, well ahead of his time, and at Emrod, he's been a huge source of inspiration to us all. Okay, so let, let's start with the uh, definition. What is wireless power transmission? We define wireless power transmission as delivering meaningful amount of energy um, without moving or employing mass between the transmitter and receiver. So typically on the transmitting side, the location is either at the edge of the grid or where energy is comparatively easy or, or economic to, uh, to achieve. Then we have to traverse a distance. Again, typically um, a, a, a distance which is ill-suited for physical connection, uh, say an ocean or a forest or another challenging terrain. And then we have the receiving side, again, typically uh, where it is either hard or expensive to use line technology, or where the uh, self-production of energy is inefficient or too expensive. Within wireless transmission, there are a few categories or modalities, if you will. The first is, uh, and I'm sure you've all heard of that one before is coupling, uh, either inductive or magnetic resonance coupling. And this is the sort of stuff that uh, is used to charge your uh, uh, contactless charging of your phones or other consumer electronics, um, sometimes cars. Then the next category is laser beaming. And this has been around for, for a while, in fact, mostly used by um, space agencies and uh, militaries, I'll, and I'll touch a little bit about the uh, applications in that category shortly. Where MROD is, is um, in the uh, microwave uh, space, specifically in the ISM band. And as you can see from that graph uh, um, of atmospheric capacity and wavelength, there are a few sweet spots namely in the visible light area and then in the microwave area. So when coming to a choose which frequencies we wanted to use, uh, it's, it's uh, clear, it's, it's easy to see why we chose to be in that sweet spot where um, the atmosphere does not present a challenge, vapor seal, uh, or carbon dioxide or ozone, I mean, all these things do not present much of a challenge, and yet we have a wavelength which is short enough to have relatively small antennas. You can see in a bit more detail the sort of important parameters that guide guided us to choose uh, the specific technology. Um, you can see that, that there's a, 
quite a compelling case in terms of power, efficiency, distance, and so on, where all the stars are aligned, if, if you will. Some of the applications that are of those uh, modalities or categories, you can see on the left, uh, a phone, uh, a mobile charging, beneath it, a mobile charger by induction for a car. Then one of the use cases for lasers, um, and I'll, I'll touch on it a bit later, drones, um, powering drones while in flight. Uh, and then you come to our technology, to MROD. Um, in this image on the top, right corner you can see a um, mobile outage response unit and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that later on and underneath you can see a pair of antennas replacing a line going through a challenging terrain in this case a forest okay so i'd like to give you some um historical context um Mostly, well, first of all, to acknowledge the, uh, the the researchers that came before us, but also to show you that where we are is the result of a gradual, uh, linear, progressive engineering uh, and science effort. It's not magic. It's something that has evolved over time and got us to where we are. So um, we have mentioned Tesla. So that was um, over 100 years ago. Then we saw the development of radar in the 30, 1930s and 40s for military use. And that was really the genesis of the transmitting side of the technology that we're using today. Then the innovation in the US, or the inventions of the rectifying antenna. Um, in, the, in 1975, there were a few very famous, um, actually, uh, experiments by Raytheon and by NASA where they demonstrated beaming power and keeping a uh, helicopter drone in flight. Um, I've touched on consumer electronics. So unfortunately, the technology that we're using to charge uh, consumer electronics, I mean, uh, coupling, is not really scalable, um, not in terms of power levels, uh, distance, and certainly uh, th there would be a pushback from the regulators because of the nature of the, the radiation. Military and autonomous platforms. So we've seen um, quite a few demonstrations of that, um, especially recently. And that belongs to really to two categories. One is harvesting energy, so solar energy in space and beaming it to Earth. Um, we saw, uh, we, we still see actually active programs. Um, I believe there's one in India, there's one in Turkey, US, China, Japan. There's a few of them. Um, it's a significant, significant engineering challenge to put structures of that magnitude in space, the rigidity, the tolerance for warping, uh, the size, sheer size of the antennas, all contribute to the fact that um, we haven't seen one deployed yet. Um, we might in the future, but uh, we're not quite there yet. However, the research and the consequent publications uh, have given us a lot. Uh, they're given us a lot in terms of the efficiencies of the radiation, the efficiencies of the uh, rectifying elements and so on. So um, this really brings us to today. So as you can see, I hope you can appreciate, it's been a gradual progress. And what we have done at MROD is really push the envelope and focus it towards commercial use. So speaking of commercial use, um, how do we make long-range wireless power transmission commercially viable? Um, well, there's, there are really um, a number of things we need to look closely and improve. One of them is distance. It's, it's quite obvious. If you can't uh, send energy over a significant distance, the, the, the applications or the range of the applications is going to be very limited. So we have addressed that. Um, efficiency. Efficiency is a key consideration, um, not in all cases, um, but in most cases where larger, large amounts of energy needs to be moved, it is a significant consideration. Energy is a business. Um, unfortunately, Nikola Tesla failed to understand that, that point. Generation of energy, transmission of energy, as you well know, is a business, and it has to make economic 
sense, it has to be efficient in order to be adopted by the market. And the same goes for reliability. Uh, it would make absolutely no sense, regardless of uh, the, the, the benefits, for a utility to adopt any technology if it's not reliable. Uh, you don't want maintenance issues. And I'll address that in a minute. Safety. Now, last but not least, safety really has been and still is the core consideration in everything that we do. Um, we must have highly safe system, but not just safe systems that we can show that they are safe. It was also very important for us to be perceived as a safe technology. We all saw, we all see the, the pushback that we get from some segments of the public um, against 5G, for example, and, and other forms of electromagnetic, um, mostly communication. It was important for us to make sure that our systems are both very safe and perceived as safe, that it's easy to demonstrate their safety. So let's get to distance, start with distance. Um, we've charted here a few of the more uh, prominent uh, demonstrations done in the past with the uh, wireless power transmission. I think uh, noteworthy are the ones by NASA, uh, Goldstone and uh, Brown and Dickinson, both in 1975, achieving both uh, longest distance, higher power, uh, and also uh, efficiency. I believe the, the one in the Brown and Dickinson in 1975 uh, demonstrated a 54% uh, end-to-end efficiency, which is quite considerable given, the, given um, it has been quite a while, uh, decades ago. Now, to put it into perspective, this is what MROD has set to achieve. So much longer distances, much higher power levels, Turning to efficiency. So uh, these are questions that have been asked a lot um, during the um, during other sessions, and I'm happy to address them. Most of the efficiency is lost on the transmitting side. We are currently uh, looking at about 70% efficiency, maximum efficiency on the transmitting side, and that is due to the, the cutting edge of uh, solid state and magnetron technologies. We see progress there. Uh, that progress is being driven mainly by communication uh, applications, but at the moment, this is the cutting edge. This is what um, inhibits us from being more efficient. The propagation through the air is quite efficient. It's close to 100% efficiency, and I'm happy to explain later on how we achieve that. Sometimes we use relays, sometimes we don't. Um, relays are passive elements. Um, made of a uh, composite uh, metamaterial structure. Their efficiency is very, very high. It's, uh, if you think about it, it's like a quasi-optic element. It's passive, it doesn't require any uh, power, it doesn't retransmit anything. It acts like a lens, refocusing the beam and pointing it to where it needs to go. On the receiving side, we have a rectifying antenna, or rectenna, as it's referred to. And that is also quite efficient. So we've got quite a lot of IP in the design of rectifying elements to achieve 90% uh, plus at the moment, but um, we think that there's a bit of work that, uh, well, more progress that can be done on that side. So all in all, if you uh, consider the efficiency of uh, the system end to end, it does depend on a few parameters like uh, the specific frequency that we choose for the scenario. But generally, it is already commercially viable in many cases where the consideration is mostly um, the continuity of supply rather than the high efficiency of supply. Another word about uh, efficiency, just a quick one. If you consider other transformative technologies uh, that we saw emerge in the past, say um, uh, solar panels, when they emerged, they were a single digit efficiency and it took about four decades for them to be subsidized by, by governments until they've reached uh, the stage where it's economically viable 
on itself. We are already at that stage and it's early days. So I'm quite optimistic about uh, the efficiency levels. Reliability. So part of it is just the fact that they're uh, replacing lines. So uh, if you consider uh, the effects of bad weather, storms and so on, you'll have uh, debris flying in the air. Much of the outages, as you know, is caused by the down, uh, downing of lines. Take out the lines, you immediately increase the reliability of the, of the system. The other thing uh, which contributes to our, the reliability of our systems is the specific frequencies that we choose, and I touched about that sweet spot before. Uh, we use weather agnostic frequencies uh, in the um, near field or in the uh, Fresnel range, to be exact, and that ensures that uh, the impact of adverse weather conditions is really negligible. Uh, so our systems are not prone to stop transmitting because of some dust or rain or any, anything else uh, weather related. And then there's the actual electronics, the circuitry. While there's quite a lot of clever IP that uh, uh, has gone into our systems and the software and the materials, the actual electronic circuitry is very uh, straightforward. It's, it's the same sort of electronics that has been used in radar systems for the last few decades. It is quite reliable. It is quite reliable. Uh, other uh, reliability elements, uh, so for example, you can see from the illustration that uh, our transmitting uh, antennas, uh, we're seeing this as well, are patch antennas. Um, they are comprised of identical tiles, which are very easy to replace. So unlike a line, when it's down, it's down, there's no electricity. If a single element, or even more than a single element, fails, we can uh, the, the whole system keeps transmitting at a slightly lower efficiency. And that element can be uh, replaced very quickly. So all in all, it is a pretty reliable system. Now, as I mentioned, safety. Safety is at the core of everything we do. So um, frequency. So the frequency that we use is in the ISM, or Industrial Scientific and Medical Band, with, um, uh, which is commonly used in Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, RFID, and some other applications. So there's a good body of knowledge uh, and regulation that relates to what you can do and what you can't do with that sort of uh, frequencies. Um, exposing people, how much time, how, uh, the level of radiation, so on. So we chose that frequency because it's commonly used and it has a good body of knowledge in terms of uh, what can be done. And it's relatively safe. I mean, um, some would push back and, and talk about uh, long-term effects, but um, that's not the topic of our conversation. Um, power density. It's not just about how much power you deliver, but also about how much power, but more importantly, how, how much power per square meter. So the power density that, the densities that we are using is uh, relatively low. Uh, just to give you some uh, reference points. So generally we're using for uh, electricity distribution applications around one or two kilowatts per square meter. We can go up to 10 uh, kilowatts per square meter or um, lower than one, but generally that's where we land on for the applications um, we are addressing. Um, so for reference, one kilowatt per square meter is what you'll get if you stand outside in the sun, uh, you know, around noon. Um, it's exactly comparable um, radiation, of course, because the sun has a range of frequencies, but it's the same same power density. So it gives you some sort of idea that our systems can't, you know, uh, punch a hole through you. The effect, even if all our uh, safety mechanisms fail, would be a gradual increase in uh, heat of the absorbing uh, element. However, we don't plan anything to be in our uh, in the beam's path. Our beam is planned to be strictly point to point, well collimated, uh, a cylindrical shape that sees nothing but clear air. It is not planned to hit birds, helicopters, or anything else, unlike uh, communication applications. And we achieve that by applying a, a low power laser 
safety curtain, which is relatively standard. Um, we also employ a laser-based matrix for the larger systems. So if anything crosses that laser curtain, say uh, a transient object like a bird, the antenna shuts down uh, or degauss. Um, in larger antennas, we can actually shut down specific elements uh, that uh, relate to uh, the object that is moving through the path of the beam. So I mentioned, the beam itself, just to reiterate, the beam itself is point to point. There's no radiation spillage behind it or, or on the sides. Um, it does not hit anything. And it's in the frequencies which are well understood and regulated. OK, so moving on to what sort of problems are addressing? Because uh, you can develop a fancy technology, but if it's not addressing some real world problems, it would never be um, adopted by the market. So here's an example of a few of the um, problems that we're addressing with this technology. Uh, you can see on the left hand side the uh, effects of others weather. Um, we are improving network resilience and reducing power outages. We're empowering communities, remote communities. Um, traditionally, I mean, there are quite a lot of uh, communities, uh, and, and I've mentioned that this is uh, something close to my heart. There are quite a lot of communities that cannot enjoy the economic prosperity that most of us do because they don't have uh, access to cheap power and communication, but before communication, and I mean, there's a lot of talk about bringing the internet everywhere. Before you bring internet, you actually need a device that can that have, you know, can be charged or can have a look at that internet. So um, that's one uh, use case that we hope um, many would adopt our technology for. Then there's the uptake of sustainable energy. Now, I've, uh, we put here a graph just to illustrate the uptake of wind power in some key markets, and you can see uh, it is a significant trend. Um, uh, wind power, solar, understandably has to be harvested where it's abundant, right? Uh, where there is wind, where there is sun. Unfortunately, those places are not necessarily where the power is consumed. So we are left with the challenge of bringing that power, transmitting that power from where it's harvested to where it's consumed. And um, that actually is some of uh, one of the biggest challenges, almost the most expensive challenges in uh, introducing um, sustainable energy. Uh, consider, for example, uh, offshore wind farms. Uh, they require um, Underwater cables. Underwater cables are notoriously expensive to maintain, to install, and sometimes it it's, uh, just uh, prohibits or inhibits the uh, adding new uh, sustainable energy projects. So we hope that using our wireless uh, transmission, many more sustainable energy projects will become economically viable and uh, hopefully cheaper as well. So it would contribute to the adoption and uh, penetration of sustainable energy. Okay, so moving on to what we actually do in, in Emrod. Now, understandably, I, I won't be able to go into uh, too many details and I'm, I'm happy to accept uh, questions afterwards, but um, let's start with a little bit, put a bit more detail on what we do. So we really have three key elements to the system. We have the transmitting antenna and uh, you can see, uh, well, we try to make it uh, clear that it's a patch antenna, a phased array, in fact. Uh, as mentioned, we're using microwaves, typically 2.4 or 5.8 gigahertz, but we can employ other frequencies depending on what is more important to the client. Uh, efficiency, sometimes efficiency is more important, sometimes the size of the antennas is more critical. We employ metamaterials. Uh, throughout the system, both on the transmitting, on the relay, and on the receiving side, as uh, beam guides and as uh, rectifying elements. So I've, I've briefly touched on the relays. They are really passive elements. 
a composite of uh, metamaterials and they act like a, a quasi optic lens refocusing the automated beam. And then we have the rectify, uh, the rect rectenna or uh, rectifying antenna. Um, we have a bit of IP here and quite a lot of work went into making it efficient. I think that was one of the uh, key areas where um, the uh, commercial viability has been held back traditionally, um, being able to make that as efficient as possible. And fortunately, with the increase of uh, computation power in recent years and uh, new materials and 3D printing, it has become easier. It's, it's still a challenge, but it's become easier to design and test uh, newer and, and more efficient rectifying elements. Okay, so let's have a look at some of the use cases. Um, power is uh, New Zealand's the second largest line company, electricity distribution company, and we've partnered with them uh, to um, fulfill trials. Now, the use case that was of most interest to PowerCo is described here. It's the edge of the grid. You can see on the left-hand side the edge of the grid where the power lines, the pylons uh, end, and challenging terrain, the galley and uh, river, and a small farm on the other side. Now, these edge grid situations are pretty common, and in many cases, they are uh, not economically viable. They're high maintenance, um, and really, in these cases, uh, the power company has to consider two things. Well, three options. One is do nothing, uh, just absorb the, the costs, spread them uh, over the fees. The second is uh, cutting off uh, or not even connecting those uh, end clients. Um, typically, you'll see uh, microgrids and batteries and sometimes some uh, something like uh, a, well, obviously solar panels or wind turbines applied. What we suggest is another solution. You can see here an antenna mounted, a transmitting antenna mounted on the transmitting side in this illustration and a receiving antenna on the user side. And that is used, that it can be relatively quickly deployed compared to uh, uh, pylons and, and copper lines and also relatively cheaply uh, compared to this scenario. Another use case is when we are traversing challenging terrain. Uh, in this uh, specific use case, it's a uh, forest. Now, moving through energy through forests is, is a pain. Uh, you have to constantly maintain vegetation to keep it off the lines. You'll have frequent outages because of uh, branches full, uh, flying in the wind and falling on those lines. Um, it, it also disturbs the wildlife. So it is, again, a compelling case for going wireless. Another interesting case is use case is uh, the mobile outage response units. Now consider um, so we, we can deploy those in uh, either planned or unplanned outages uh, if you have maintenance on your grid. Uh, instead of uh, taking a neighborhood down, you can deploy uh, a transmitting and receiving van and bridge that that gap in, temporarily. Same concept, but uh, with a slightly different, uh, well, somewhat different devices can be used for disaster relief. So if you think of hurricanes, cyclones, uh, when the power is down and you uh, want to get the power up as quickly as possible, it's pretty, a pretty efficient temporary measure. Another use case where oh, we actually don't supply, we don't propose a continuous supply of energy, but uh, rather a backup system. So for mission critical organizations, such as hospitals or telcos, um, instead of using these expensive, polluting, noisy uh, diesel generators, which are also limited in terms of uh, what, uh, well, what they give you in terms of, of um, length, we propose uh, backup systems, uh, and they are typically connected to a, an alternative part of the network, so it will only be used when the power is down.
I mentioned briefly uh, sustainable energy. Um, you can see a couple of examples here, a solar farm and an offshore wind farm. Again, replacing that expensive transmission and supporting sustainable energy generation. So this was uh, all about current, uh, our current focus or our current work with uh, utilities or line companies. Um, we are also looking at other verticals. We have been approached by uh, shipping companies, and I'll briefly touch on a couple of uh, use cases that we're looking at. One is electric boats or ships, mostly ferries in Europe. Um, if you can get rid of most of the batteries by beaming power from the shore continuously while the, sh the, the boat is moving, um, you can get rid of, of most of the batteries. Now, getting rid of most of the batteries means less weight, more efficiency, more range, and you don't need to come back to charge, so you can operate longer hours. And that really unlocks the potential of electric shipping. Another use case, and I, th I think this uh, image illustrates it quite clearly, when large container ships or other commercial vessels are docked in port, they typically keep running their huge engines just to create that little uh, electricity that they need on board while they're docked and that's highly inefficient that's polluting so we've been asked by a number of ports to have a look at uh, can we beam power to ships while they're docked instead of uh, them running them their, their engines and um, the uh, the benefits are clear right i mean the shipping companies save uh, money on fuel the uh, ports uh, you know, provide a service that they can sell, uh, so additional re revenues. And some of those use cases quite, uh, quite uh, in the near future. Um, electric aviation. <laughs> so it was mentioned in my uh, in my initial slide. So this is will uh, uh, finish. This uh, quote, we wanted flying cars, instead we got 140 characters, uh, by uh, a famous quote by Peter Thiel. He was referring to, uh, to um, uh, Twitter, of course. So, Mr. Thiel, um, flying cars are here, they have been here for a while. Uh, there are about a dozen companies that created uh, electric um, airborne platforms. The main issue that is preventing it from being adopted by the market is the batteries. The batteries are very heavy. If you could continuously charge these or power these uh, electric airborne platforms while in flight, you can get rid of most of the batteries. So that's less weight, more range, and more operation time. So suddenly unlocking that as a possibility. We're not quite there yet. Uh, it requires more than just being able to deliver power efficiently. There are quite a few um, um, challenges here, and I'm happy to elaborate if anybody is interested. So that is really the conclusion of my uh, slides, my presentations. Um, shall we open it for uh, some questions? If there are yeah, any... yeah. Uh, Greg, before you wrap up, uh, can you just elaborate a little bit more on the the flying car bit, you said that you can elaborate if somebody asks, yes. and therefore I'm asking. Okay. So the easiest case is obviously uh, geostatic uh, platforms. So say you want to keep a platform over a certain area uh, continuously, right? Uh, typically, um, as a sensor platform, for example. Typically, you, uh, today, we use balloons and a tethered wire going all the way up. So you, you can imagine uh, the, the, you know, the issues with a, such a wire. It's, it's heavy, it's cumbersome. If you can, so the easiest is to, to we, we, we are going to start with charging these uh, platforms, uh, geostatic platforms, because the target is not moving and it's unmanned. So both in terms of the regulatory possible pushback and uh, the technical challenge, this is relatively easy. The next step, and we're not the only ones to look at it, actually, um, the US Air Force and Navy have been uh, looking at it actively for, for a long time, 
is powering drones in flight. Um, in that case, there are, there are two main approaches. One is the uh, more efficient uh, approach when uh, it's mostly commercial drones, uh, and those typically use microwaves in, in various ranges, usually relatively high uh, frequencies. And the other one is lasers, um, and that's because you can keep the antennas relatively small. Uh, the size of the antenna is proportional, uh, obviously, to the wavelength you are deploying. So we do hope that our technology and the technology that is currently with um, you know, more DOD-oriented organizations is going to go into civilian use. I can say more than that. So look, our technology, like you know, other transformative technology, has been developed to address a certain issue, a certain set of problems. Um, in, in, in our, pro, in, in our you know, case, it's um, utilities. Uh, we looked at uh, trans transmitting significant amounts of electricity to consumers. Um, let's look at some, some other example. Um, uh, internet. The internet was uh, created by DARPA to um, create this indestructible communication system for a nuclear doomsday and then adopted by universities as a means to exchange information. Now, I bet you that they haven't thought of Twitter and Facebook and TikTok, right? They didn't have social media, or online banking, all these things uh, in mind. The huge bar running of uh, internet happened when that moved into the public domain. And I have addressed some of the use cases that we're looking at, but honestly, the thing that keeps us going, the thing that keeps us very excited is we want to see what this technology is going to be used, what wireless energy uh, transmission is going to be used when the general public starts using it, when more and more companies start utilizing it for, for their own usages. Every time we talk to a... Uh, there's literally not a day where we have where we're not contacted by some um, company that uh, suggests a new application. So, um, commercial flight, a commercial electric flight, is probably possible and not too far away. But really, the thing that keeps us most excited is those applications that we can't see just yet. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you for that perspective. Uh... While in India, we'd like to see flying carts uh, uh, to beat our traffic conditions, but I think in a more practical sense, uh, this would be very relevant in the area of uh, drones and so on, because particularly in the context of disaster management, uh, recently during the monsoon in India, we had a lot of floods in many places and accessibility was cut off and even medicines were not available. So, so these are the kind of technologies that can sort of change the ability to deliver services to citizens in, in times of distress. So that's one of the big areas also we can see going forward. Uh, at the edge of the network, yes, uh, we have a lot of uh, those kind of situations in the developing world. India is part of that. And uh, uh, electricity and connectivity along with water supply are today considered uh, as the three basic ingredients uh, to lead a reasonable life. But at the edge of the network, we also have the socioeconomic impact. Uh, today, if I can get electricity going to people who don't have it, it's not just about convenience or comfort. It can also change their lives dramatically in terms of opportunity, in terms of ability to access new uh, ways of living, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, with that, uh, uh, thank you for that uh, very incisive presentation. I think it's opened a lot of eyes of everybody. Uh, and with that, I would request uh, Kasi on the question and answer session. Since we are at about 10.42, uh, Kashi, how shall we deal with the question and answer session? Do we have questions that we would like to uh, pose to Greg immediately, or shall we compile it and send it to him by email, and he can answer it uh, more le more leisurely or more comfortably? Uh, okay, Greg, Greg has five, five, six minutes. We can go through the quick questions, few questions. So, Greg, do you have five more, five, sure. six minutes? Absolutely. Let me, just let me read these questions for you. So the first question is on how economical the wireless power transmission over HVDAC and HVDC or ultra, ultra HVAC and HVDC. Okay, so uh, if I understand correctly, the, the question relates to uh, a few things. So uh, when you're asking how economic that is, you're, as far as I understand, you're asking about the uh, efficiency of the system and how the price, the, both the CapEx and OPEX, 
is compared to the benchmark uh, solutions. Um, the, question, the question includes both. Okay. So in terms of efficiency, I've touched about, uh, on it, uh, so I'll just mention it very briefly. Um, End-to-end -end efficiency level that we're currently looking at is around the 50, 60 percent. And that's early days, so we do expect it to uh, increase. However, that level of efficiency um, at the moment obviously means that for large scale continuous movement of uh, say um, hundreds of megawatts or gigawatts, the, the, it, it won't be economical because the losses of energy uh, would be significant compared to line technology. Uh, it does make sense where uh, in those use cases that we've discussed where continuity of supply is, or, or other issues, say uh, right of, of passage, for example, are uh, painful enough to use a slightly less efficient technology. In terms of costs, I'm happy to say that um, we stack up very, really well. Um, while there are quite clever, those are relatively um, not expensive pieces of electronics to manufacture and uh, deploy. Um, so they're, they're in, in many cases, especially when long distance is involved, um, the economics definitely stands up really, really well compared to pylons and, and copper uh, technology. I mean, I, I can't go into numbers because there's so many use cases, but uh, generally speaking, it's it's very economical in those use cases. Uh, distance, relatively low power, and so on. Uh, Kasi, can I just interject here? Sure. Uh, I think that we need to differentiate uh, the fact that what Greg is talking about is not an alternative to bulk power transmission, where we are talking of several thousand megawatt and so on and so forth. Correct. Uh, I think where, what Emerald is trying to propose or has been focused on developing is a technology for other use cases other than bulk power transmission. Am I right, Greg? You're absolutely yeah. correct. I mean, in the future, when this technology is a bit more mature and a bit more efficient, I'm certain that um, when the threshold of you know, the, the level of efficiency increases, we'll see more and more adoption for higher levels of, of bulk power and transmission. But that's not the case now. You're absolutely correct. It's more those use cases where uh, the, the comparable benchmark technology uh, is relatively un unconvenient or expensive. That's correct. Okay. So next, next question talks easy. about, the, yeah. the next question talks about uh, what kind of obstacles should be avoided in line of sight? Is there a difference in efficiency with obstacles? Sure. So, an obstacle, we, so obviously, um, as, as your question alluded to, uh, there, uh, the, the systems require line of sight. Um, I haven't mentioned it, but um, it is a collimated beam uh, point to point, so it requires line of sight between the elements. Now, we don't place those elements uh, when there is a building in the middle. Obviously, we're going to put them relatively high where typically there's no obstruction. Having said that, uh, a bird uh, or another transient object like a helicopter, uh, th this is a scenario that can happen. Um, it doesn't really matter what enters the path of the beam. We will the, the 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 system will react exactly the same manner. It will shut down either or degauss the whole beam or parts of it. The idea is it doesn't really matter what enters the, the beam's path. Uh, nothing will um, uh, the beam only sees clear air, uh, just clear air. It never uh, never hits anything, any transient object. So um, really, that doesn't really matter uh, what that object was. So thank you for that, uh, Greg. So next question is on: Can you um, can you throw some light on safety aspects of the wireless power transmission? Sorry, uh, sorry, uh, was that a question? The question is: uh, So is there any safety aspects on wireless power transmission? Can you highlight some safety issues with uh, the safety requirements? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, I've talked about the um, inherent safety features of the system, the frequencies, the uh, uh, laser curtain uh, mechanism, and, and so on. Safety requirements are, as with any piece of uh, high power electronics, uh, there are safety issues 
relating to uh, weatherproofing, to parameters of you know uh, what it is can and cannot be do uh, can be done uh, close to the system. There are no special uh, uh, safety requirements uh, compared to you know, other uh, type of electronic uh, um, equipment. In fact, it's it's far safer than the uh, equivalent uh, communication antennas. So th there's nothing in particular uh, I can mention that is a, is of a concern. So it's not a question, it's a compliment from one of the uh, audience saying that, okay, it's one of the best presentation that he has seen in the last oh. few years. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your support. I appreciate it. The one more question is on that is on the, yeah. So when we talk about EM electromagnetic radiation, are these not harmful to humans, animals, or birds? They go friendly. It's a question on impact of uh, electromagnetic radiation on. Uh, animals and birds and humans. So look, um, obviously there's ill effect to uh, electromagnetic radiation and uh, we don't have the scope to start uh, discussing it. Uh, there's short term effects and long term effects. Um, you know, I don't, I don't want to get into that. Uh, it's highly political debate, you know, about 5G and so on. So I think that the main thing to remember about our technology is regardless of uh, what you believe about that frequency radiation, right? Um, 5.8 or 2.4, our beam never touches anything. Um, there's no radiation spillage behind, there's no side lobes. Um, uh, so really, it doesn't really matter if we're throwing stones. Um, uh, we provide a pipe and that pipe touches nothing and there's no radiation spillage around it. So regardless of that, what you believe uh, to be the case about you know, the, the health uh, related issues with electromagnetic radiation, um, our radiation doesn't touch anything except the transmitting element and the receiving element. Okay. So can this technology be applied for a local distribution center, local distribution network, or is it only for a point to point or long, or maybe the given distance of 10 kilometers, can it be applied in a, a downtown areas? Look, um, technically, of course it can. Uh, the uh, we, you can you know use it for, for for twenty centimeters gap or twenty kilometers gap. In fact, we're looking at powering uh, an, an island uh, which is thirty kilometers offshore in one hop. So, it, it's it's definitely applicable for urban scenarios as well. However, I believe that um, because of uh, the uh, in, in highly dense populated areas, I th I believe that we'll see more pushback from the regulator. So public opinion is quite important, uh, and uh, the regulator is always compelled to address public opinion. So if you use it in urban areas, technically, of course, it's possible. It's actually quite easy, but I don't believe that would be the first set of applications. But again, I'm, I might be wrong. I mean, uh, there might be a pain, uh, enough pain in some scenarios I, um, that would justify using it in urban areas. It's certainly possible, technically. So one last question is on the, uh, what is the impact of weather on this technology? Whether like uh, cyclones or rains, is it really mm -hmm. going to have any distraction on this technology or any efficiency loss? There's no significant uh, efficiency loss. I mean, one, one of the reasons that we chose this, uh, the frequency that we chose is because it's still a frequency which uh, lets us keep a, a relatively reasonable size of antennas and, and price of components, but it's also, uh, Pretty much impervious to uh, potential atmospheric uh, disturbances. Um, you know, uh, people talk about uh, carbon dioxide or, or uh, ozone, but most of the disturbances are from things like uh, rain or or water vapor, and our systems are not susceptible to it. So uh, there's not going to be any worth mentioning uh, disturbance due to rain, for example. Okay. So having said that. Especially for the long distances, we're talking about uh, quite large antennas. Uh, they, these are large structures, and they are prone to, uh, you know, the vulnerability of any large structure. Um, you know, strong wind can affect it, and uh, in the same way that you weatherproof, uh, you know, high power lines, um, we would expect that um, these systems are going to be weatherproofed as well. So while it can be 
affected by whether it's not in the efficiency of the transmission. Good to know that it is a weather proof kind of technology. Uh, Dr. Kashi, if you permit, I would like to ask one question. Please go ahead, sir. Okay. Uh, Greg, it was a very great lecture. Thanks for the uh, highlighting about the technology innovation. Uh, from the transmitter to the relay to the uh, 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 receiver, uh, you have shown on the uh, bottom actually the connection uh, between the transmitter, relay, and also the receiver. Whether that ground connection is required, does it mean that there is a ground return path? No, no. Ground connection is, is required. Okay, because we have shown all them connected by a black strip. I just wanted to oh. know whether there is any return path required. <laughs> I, I, I will share our graphic designer. <laughs> sure. uh, there's, there's no uh, ground connection uh, required. The transmitting uh, element and the receiving element are completely, uh, completely uh, independent. And moreover, the relays are not only independent, they are passive. So you don't need to bring power or uh, access roads. You can, you can place them where they're needed. Okay, fine. Okay. Because that connection was there, it was a confusion for me. That is why. Thank you. Okay, I will improve. Greg, uh, please, Greg, please don't fire your graphic designer. He's not an electrical engineer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks for that. So one thing is, uh, how many relays are needed per kilometer? Is there any size and some rule kind of thing? Or is it purely based on the uh, line of sight? It's really just a line of sight. I mean, if you... Uh enough you'll hit the i mean the, the curvature of the earth is going to start affecting you at the 40 or 50 kilometers um th there's there's no uh technical um issue with any distance we can always daisy chain a number of relays and as, as i mentioned they're very efficient however there are practical uh, considerations if you're trying to transmit over a very large distance say 40 or 50 kilometers uh in one hop say to an island um the size of the antennas are going to be very large and for practical reasons um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, the public won't like that so while there's no technical limit to the distance it does there, there is a practical limit to the size of the antennas that are acceptable okay. so based on suppose if you wanted to transfer power for 10 kilometers typically how many relays are required it really depends on the, the client. So if the client, uh, if, for example, you have a, an issue with a right of passage uh, with the landowners and you want to avoid uh, putting any relays, you, you'll typically want one hop. So that means larger antennas. Okay. Um, Got it. Fine. Yeah. I mean, if, if the terrain is not that big, you know, put uh, relays every 500 meters or three kilometers, I mean, it really depends on the, on the client and the situation. So it's a trade-off between the size of the antenna and the number of relays. Yes. So the, the I haven't mentioned it before. So the size of the antenna, the level of power, and the distance are correlated. Uh, the larger the antenna, the uh, longer the distance you can do in one hop. Well, these are the. We don't have any further questions from the audience. Yeah. Back to you, Mustafa Sir. Yeah. The topic so uh, complex and interesting that I'm sure there will be more questions. Uh, as and when we receive them, Greg, uh, you have now got yourself into a problem. We will send you more questions. <laughs> I'm ha happy to address uh, those questions. It's actually uh, uh -huh. good to get the more clarity we can shed on this subject, uh, the, the better. Yeah, at the IEEE PES, uh, uh, particularly the Bangalore section, which has been responsible for organizing this event, I'm sure this will uh, sort of uh, uh, create more interest and you can expect more interaction going forward. Uh, with that, uh, I think we need to wrap up this session. We uh, at one level, OK, we started a little 10 minutes, 15 minutes late, but I think Greg has been very efficient. And so has the audience in terms of not challenging us with too many questions at this stage. Uh, we thank you very much, Greg, for sparing your time in uh, far away New Zealand and participating with us in this event. On behalf of the IEEE organizing committee, I thank you for that. And we look forward to having uh, more interaction from the IEEE PES with you and your colleagues uh, to see how this technology at one level can be used to impact the lives of people who do not have access to electricity at another level to enable those technologies like drones and so on. So more commercially acceptable and viable uh, and overcoming current limitations that are there. And surely there are many other applications which I'm sure 
will unfold as we go along. Uh, with this, uh, thank you and thank, thanks to your team for all the support. Thank you very thank much. You so much. Thanks for having me today.